you. Thank you, Adrian. And thanks for the uh, introduction from uh, all the uh, organizers for inviting me to give the, this talk. Um, we are interested in doing absolute free energy calculations, which is probably slightly untrendy at the moment. Most people seem to be doing relative calculations because they're a little bit easier, I guess, and you get the benefit of cancellation of errors. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a recent example that we've been looking at, which is to do with Bromo domains. And just to sort of fill you in on the picture a little bit, um, Bromo domains are small protein molecules or domains that uh, recognize acetylated lysines on histones. And that is part of a recognition process that controls transcription and, and, and things like that. And there are 61 Bromo domains found in 41, uh, 46 human proteins. And there are therapeutic potential generally in the, in the case of cancer, but also in, in things like inflammation and viral infection as well. And <clears throat> this is what they, they kind of look like. They're a small uh, sort of spore helix bundle. And you can see here there's a little pocket at the top. And this is where the histone comes in. This is what you recognize as the natural uh, <coughs> agonist, uh, sort of natural binding pot partner, which is this acetylated lysine here. So this is a conserved fold across all the, all the bromo domains. And this asparagine is key in recognizing the acetylated lysine. It's almost 100% conserved, not quite 100% conserved, but almost. And <coughs> there's also, uh, just going back to the previous speaker, there's also a nice conserved network of water molecules in the bottom of the pocket here as well, which have also received a lot of attention in the past in the context of drug design. And fortunately for us, um, it's quite a small protein. I say it's fortunately because that helps the sampling issue. And also fortunately, it doesn't appear to move much as well, which is also uh, rather handy for the sampling issue as well. So um, in the case of it being a drug target, um, although a few of them have been very well characterized, the links between the pathology and individual bromo domains is still not clear in all cases. And so there's a desire generally to develop selective probes, even if you're not uh, interested in developing actual drug molecules, the idea of getting, of getting selective probes is still useful. And we have lots of ITC data, isothermal titration calorimetry data, and crystal structures, uh, mainly from the, uh, the SGC, um, for both diverse series of compounds and <coughs> for multiple um, proteins. And we wanted actually at the time, this goes back to how we kind of got interested in this, actually it's going back about five or six years ago, uh, the SGC was rather interested in trying to understand better the ITC data per se, and to say, well, could you actually try and use that in a more prospective uh, a way rather than using it what, you know, what yours normally happens in a retrospective fashion, you get an odd result, perhaps in the free energy of binding, and then you go back and you say, oh, well, it's obviously this because there's a strong enthalpic contribution or so on and so forth. So originally, this was kind of the driver for us, actually, was trying to understand the ITC data better. But we realized early on that, of course, to do that, you actually have to be able to predict the free energy um, better as well. And actually, in the case of absolute binding free energy calculations, which is what we were uh, proposing to do because of those diverse molecules, it wasn't easy, it wasn't really obvious how you could do relative calculations between a diverse set of molecules. So we had to use absolutes. Um, but the, the, as the field wasn't quite as mature, I'd say, as relative binding free energies, we really needed to make sure that we could validate this pretty well before we, we did anything more. And so um, that leads us on to sort of three test cases, which I'm going to walk you through, just to give you a flavor of actually where we think the state of the art, if you like, is with regards to absolute free energy calculations. So this is kind of like, uh, essentially, it's kind of benchmark, if you like. So the first case is this diverse ligands for BDR4. And this is the methodology that we're, we're adopting. It's nothing particularly fancy, as it were. And you've seen most of these kinds of alchemical transformations uh, before. So it's just a version of that, essentially. This is just uh, how we're doing it. We're doing this all in Gromax. These are the kinds of numbers of windows that we're employing using Hamiltonian exchange. At the time, we were using GAF 1.5 for this first study for the ligand parameterization. And the, the sort of um, the over, overarching sort of guideline for us was to kind of follow the best practice as far as possible. Because at this point in time, there were several reports coming out of the literature about several little tweaks that you could do to maybe enhance the accuracy of certain things. So all we did was to basically say, well, let's just see how far you can get or how well you can do just adopting what is currently best practice in the literature. 
So, yeah, so the first case is this diverse series of ligands against BD or BRD41, which is one of the bromates. So this is the, the diverse set that we have. So you can see here these are very uh, different compounds. So it's uh, quite hard to imagine mapping between these different compounds in a relative free energy calculation scenario. And this is, <coughs> this is the, the crux of it. So I've shown this kind of data before, so I'm not going to talk too much on this. But this is the calculated versus the experimental. You can see here, this is pretty accurate. So of course, this is slightly cheating because we knew the, the answer before we started in this case. But the mean absolute <coughs> error is pretty impressive. It's down to 0.6. Um, <coughs> and it gives quite a nice good uh, correlation coefficients for this as well. <coughs> and this is done with three creeps per calculation, just, just for Peter. So you can see. So, <laughs> so you can see here these are genuine error bars, right? Uh, um, so we were rather keen to make sure that we did have a genuine estimate of the error in this case. Um, but of course that was slightly artificial. Um, in a real discovery scenario you wouldn't have all that luxury of knowing the crystal structures. So we went back and uh, tried to dock or re replicate a sort of docking scenario. So we docked all of this, the, uh, the ligands back into the protein. And of course when you do docking you get lots of different uh, solutions to that. That's why there's more solutions here than there are uh, ligands. And the docking does a pretty good job, right? So, I mean, you can actually see that uh, when you look at the docking results, everything is in the right place. So you get pretty good RMSDs. And even in the case where some of the RMSDs look a bit suspicious, the, um, the main interactions in the binding pocket are pretty well conserved, and all of this stuff is kind of flopping in the breeze anyway, so we weren't too worried about that. And it turns out <coughs> that although you can, of course, you get quite nice docking pose solutions, of course, you get fantastic correlations with the, uh, the scoring function, and you've probably all seen something similar to that before. But when you then re-rank your sort of, um, or you calculate all of the solutions with the free energy approach, then you can actually get, recover some of that nice correlation again, and the error is pretty good still. It's not quite as good as I've shown you for the crystal structure starting points, down at about 1 kcal per mole, but it's still pretty, pretty impressive. And what I wanted to sort of move on to talk most of today about was actually doing the other kind of question. So that was saying, here's a lot of different, different ligands binding to one particular protein. But there's another kind of um, question, which is basically, if you have one ligand, can you say which protein it likes to bind to? Okay. So <clears throat> in other words, multiple bromodomains in our case. Okay. So we have this compound called bromosporin, okay, which is a broad spectrum inhibitor of uh, bromodomains. And lots of ITC data for this guy. And we also have, for 21 of these um, proteins, we also have a crystal structure in the APO form in the PDB. And now we've moved on to GAF 1.7, and I'll come on to talk a little bit about torsional reparameterization as well. So a nice spread of um, free energy of binding to different bromosporin, uh, bromo domains here to explore. Uh, of course, we don't know the binding pose, or we didn't know the binding pose. So again, this time we have to use docking to get the initial poses. And then we calculate the free energy, the absolute free energy, for each of those individual poses. Okay? And then the top five I'm showing you here. So this is our favorite one, if you like. This is the best binding or the best binding pose. Okay? And then we've got sort of potential candidates from the docking solution that score slightly worse. Okay? And as we were doing this work, um, a crystal structure did actually appear. And we were holding our breath rather nervously, but actually fortuitously for us, it's actually, we got the right answer, so that was good, right? So this is, the, uh, this is our best pose, this is number one, compared with the, the crystal structure that came out. Okay, so this is this BRPF1 with Rose for it. Okay. So it's a pretty good overlay, the RST is about 2.3. So that gave us pretty good confidence that this approach was, was likely to be okay, and we could proceed just using the dock solutions that we had evaluated from, from, this, from the early part of the study. Um, so this is the upshot. This is calculated versus experimental. You can see here, this is not quite as nice, right? We're having trouble with this. This is a very much harder problem to solve. You can see here, we're down at a mean unsigned error of about 1.7 kcals per mole. Not so good on the correlation as well. So at this point, I presented some of this earlier last year to maybe some of you have seen some of this before. And there were several suggestions uh, from that discussion of things that we should be trying. So we tried uh, rest charges. So we're using AMC1 BCC charges. We tried rest charges. That made things worse. That was bad. <coughs> we tried a longer sampling in each of the uh, each of the windows. So instead of 10, we went up to 30. And that made no difference. We started from the crystal structure now, where that was available. Made no difference. <laughs> we started from different end state starting structures. So what I mean by that is that 
in the in the in the series of windows, you kind of you annihilate from or you create from a certain position, and usually you just use that same one and move the windows along as it were. But in this case, we tried to say, well, if you start from the APO state and equilibrate that a bit longer before you start the actual uh, go into the lambda regime, perhaps you approach it from that direction, you should actually get a better equilibration or a faster approach. You do get slight improvement, you do get faster equilibration or convergence of the windows, but it's it's not not particularly um, improving in the accuracy. So people suggested that oh, you might want to look at the torsions because you know the GAF torsions are not that great. And <clears throat> in particular the sulfonamide torsion. So we did look at all the torsions. And the sulfonamide one is indeed pretty poor. This is just an example of the, this is the sulfonamide torsion, in fact. So you can see here, this is uh, the high level of theory. This is the result you get. This is then GAF uh, 1.7. You can see here the barriers are in the wrong place. Okay. So then we reparametrized uh, that to give us new molecular mechanics parameters and put those in. And yeah, you get a slight improvement. So this is the result of that. Now we get a slightly better mean unsquared uh, error. Um, but a still pretty poor uh, correlation. And actually, we couldn't really get much better than that. That's probably about the limit for, for this. So I think that probably, I'll come back to you at the end what, what that might be. So that's one example where we try to do um, one ligand, if you like, against different proteins. A second example is, well, it's kind of two ligands in this case, looking at the BET subfamily. So it's one small subfamily of these bromidomates. And <coughs> this is the, the kind of subfamily here. So there's kind of two branches to this BET subfamily, B, so-called BD1, okay, and BD2. And there are two compounds of interest for, with respect to these Roma domains. One is this RVX208, okay, which is selective, okay, meaning that it binds uh, slightly better to BD2. Okay, so this is the data here. So it binds slightly better to BD2 than compared to DD, BD1. But this RVXOH compound is non-selective. Okay, you don't get any selectivity. Okay? And the difference between these two molecules, if you look, is just here. This is an OH, and this has this epoxy hydroxyl group here. Okay, so it's quite a small cell difference. Okay? And this guy is, as I said, non-selective. So <clears throat> can we actually recover that using absolute free energy calculations is the question. Okay? Now, <clears throat> there's a slight twist to this, because actually if you look at how these compounds bind in the binding site, the 208 compound, this is the selective guy, okay? He binds, yeah, in the same orientation, okay? That's what you would expect, right? But the RVOH compound, okay? This one binds in a different orientation, okay? And this is something that sometimes people take for granted, especially when doing the relative free energy regimes, is that you have the same binding mode between the regimes, okay? And you would have probably have missed this if you had adopted that kind of approach here. So this is kind of intriguing. Now, it turns out that this, um, the epoxy group that's on this guy cannot actually bind in this pose. Okay? So that's the reason why you get a slight difference between these. So that's kind of intriguing. The good news is that when you do the absolute binding free energy calculations, you actually recover the right pose. Okay? So the calculations do actually say that this guy is a better binder in this orientation compared to this possible orientation for BD1. Okay? So it's all consistent. It's all really nice. So these are the predicted affinities, okay? So we can recover that quite nicely. So the 208 compound, we can see generally binds to BD2 compounds uh, pretty much uh, with a, a much better, as it were, than the BD1 compounds at a, at a significant level, with this p-value here at 0.03. And when we look at the RVOX uh, OH compounds, then we see that actually that selectivity has kind of disappeared and actually reproducing exactly what you see experimentally, which is kind of nice. So no significant difference between these two different uh, two different types of bromidum. Okay. So that was that was kind of a, a really nice uh, result, and this is put it, put, putting it in the same kind of plots that I've showed you before. So calculated versus experimental. You can see here now we're down into a very good mean absolute error again, 0.8 kcal per mole. Really quite nice, a reasonable correlation coefficients. Um, <coughs> so again, we're, we're actually doing quite well with these absolute calculations in this sense. So <clears throat> I hope I've sort of managed to convince you in this sort of brief uh, talk that uh, we're able to identify the crystallographic pose from a set of possible poses, which is quite important when you don't actually know that answer up front. Okay? And you can do quite a good job, quite accurate, so RMS errors of 1 to 2 kcals of predicting the affinities of ligands with diverse scaffolds. Okay? 
And we can predict selectivity well for one case, the RBX compounds, but perhaps not so well for this bromosporin compound. And <laughs> that suggests to us that uh, ligand parameters are still problematic. I think all the things we've tried, and what's not an exhaustive list, and welcome more suggestions to try, but it seems that somewhere those ligand parameters are still a little bit problem problematic. But even worse than that, identifying the source of these errors is non-trivial. We had a little bit of a discussion about this yesterday, but I think even for these kinds of problems, identifying exactly where the source of the error is, is kind of tricky, okay? And ultimately, relating affinity back to the protein structures is actually still difficult. Although you can say, yeah, this one does better than this one, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Actually, the reasons why, we still don't really actually have a good way of doing that, I would say. Okay? Perhaps we might hear something about that in the next talk. Maybe, no, <laughs> maybe not. Um, and I'd say also it's important for us as a free energy community to have kind of markers in the sand. Okay, so what I mean by that is kind of data where this is kind of where we are at this point in time, and you know, this is what you should be aiming at. So if you've got a method that you think is uh, better or faster or more accurate, then you know, you have something that you can aim at and say, this is where we are, this is the same data. And to that, to that extent, we've tried to be very open about uh, the data set. So the complete input files from the first study in the chemical science paper are available on Zenodo, so anybody can download the input files, okay? The complete input files again for the JAX paper, uh, which had the bromosporin and the RBX study, are available on the JAX uh, supplementary information. Mateo, who also did, uh, also did all this work, I should add, um, did a nice tutorial on Gremax, uh, using Gremax 16 at the alchemistry.org website. And I'll just end with uh, this quote, whoops, this, uh, this quote, which was on Derek Lowe's um, uh, blog last <laughs> in February when the paper came out. So we're getting quite close, but maybe not close enough for some additional chemists. Okay. <laughs> so with that, I will end, and I will <coughs> actually thank Matteo, because Matteo did all of the work and deserves all the praise. He sat over there somewhere. There he is. And so all the praise he's now post off with uh, both Groot. I thank Stefan at the SGC and the guys at Unitech and these guys for computer time and you guys for listening. Thanks. Thank you.